All right, as, um, as we study making our way in, I uh, just want to so just check everything is working. I am. Um, just want to say to you guys, I, I don't know what you know, um, but we are live streaming this uh, via the Sports Podium Facebook site. Um, so there's a, a link in there, you can go in there. Uh, we will also be doing uh, edited clips of this, so all the speakers can put that on to YouTube as well and share that. So after the event, you guys just can have a look. You can look at our uh, at the, at the tweet, Twitter feeds from Sports Podium. Um, they will announce all the various um, videos going up as they go after the event. Rob, is there um, a Wi-Fi password here? Uh, the Wi-Fi password, no, that, not that I have. Just open? Yeah. Just join in the Okay, so it's an open... An open connection if you guys don't do that. <laughs> that fills me with confidence, by the way. <laughs> so I'm just waiting for the last few people to make their way in. Um, and then I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, I met I met Lorian uh, last year. It's about a year ago. Um, we had a we had the speaker's dinner, which we had on the night before. We just had the speakers get to know each other. Uh, we started speaking about a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, I must say, in my journey in the year and a bit that I've been in crypto, crypto, I said it to Mitchell as well yesterday, what I'm loving about the crypto world is just the interesting and wonderful people I'm meeting. Um, I think there are a certain kind of personality that's gravitating towards this space. Um, Gavin, and I will quote Gavin again, but that's one of his first statements he said to me uh, right up front is, you know, not everybody in crypto is a crook, but all crooks know <laughs> crypto. I don't think I've met many crooks yet. I know they're out there. They're probably speaking to them uh, in the nameless face this way that they would like to operate. But the people that I've met um, physically face-to-face -face in the this world is, is, is interesting people, people that you love to you spend some time with and, and, and talk to. Lauren definitely fills uh, that space as well. Um, we've we've uh, had cause to, to speak to each other through the year. Um, not enough, but uh, you know when we do, it's always, it's always entertaining. Lorian is a Bitcoin maximalist. Big words. Um, he, 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 he says that about himself, um, but I think Lorian also thinks about the bigger crypto world uh, and, and not just Bitcoin. He sees it as a place, uh, but in his mind, Bitcoin is, is, is Mr. Bitcoin South Africa, um, and he talks all over the world. He's been on TED Talks, he's been speaking to governments and to central bankers um, and, and ad advising him uh, <laughs> about cryptocurrency and, and what they should or shouldn't do. Um, Lorraine, I know you've got the group of all that heart and you're covering for us there, so thank you, buddy. Um, but without further ado, please, Lorraine, uh, keep big hand for Lorraine Gamera. Thank you. thank you very much, um, and uh, uh, th thanks for coming here, and uh, thanks, Rob and Yaku and Kodra, for inviting me back. I uh, can't believe it's been a year since we last had a con this conference and uh, it was really cool. It's really nice and intimate and it's nice to meet everybody and I hope I can meet everybody uh, today. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, just also, you know, on the Bitcoin maximalist thing, um, you know, when I, when I say that, of course I don't mean that everything else is rubbish. You know, uh, I think that there's always going to be, uh, as Gav said in his last slide, you know, there's, it's a dot-com boom. You know, there's going to be all sorts of ideas coming out into the space and some will succeed and some will fail. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, um, you know uh, uh, there will be winners and losers. And uh, in terms of currency, though, you know, I'm always, uh, 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 you know, when it comes to about what kind of currency is, are they going to be? You know, I think the world only really needs one. You know, uh, the, one of the biggest issues in the world today is moving money around the world. And there's all these frictions, you know, when you want to exchange in and out of currencies. And so when I talk about being a Bitcoin maximalist, I just think that, well, you know, there's, there's going to be a predominant main currency. I hope it's Bitcoin because, uh, you know, I've had a long history with Bitcoin. But, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I don't matter, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as we can have the censorship-resistant, decentralized, sound money. You know, that to me is, is, is the most important thing. So as a maximalist, I think that there's going to be a predominant currency, but I in no way think that all these other things are rubbish. I think Steam is cool. I think... You know, Ethereum is cool. I think all these other things are cool. I don't know so much about Ripple, uh, but uh, I think that you know, all these decentralized uh, services. I think they're very, they're very cool. So, uh, and I hope that they all uh, achieve greatness and change the world in very cool ways. 
Okay, so uh, when I when I was uh, uh, invited to come and speak here, uh, uh, I said, well, what should I speak on? I asked Rob and uh, Yaku, and they said, it doesn't matter, just come and talk. So uh, what I want to do then is I want to come and talk about what I think is the most important thing in crypto today, the most important topic that there is today, and it obviously revolves around Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the first currency, and everything has kind of followed in its, in its, in its uh, stead. You know, uh, it's reached a massive scale, it's everywhere, there's exchanges, there are merchants, there are wallets, you know, nothing is as well supported and has been around for as long as Bitcoin. And so everything that you, you can see what's happening in Bitcoin, I think you're going to be able to see it happen in these other currencies. All these other currencies are new and fresh, you know, so they're exciting and they don't have the same warts and things that we've seen with Bitcoin. But uh, they will all get there, you know, if they, if they achieve greatness. Trust me, all these other currencies like Dash and Monero, they're all going to have scaling problems, they're all going to have political infighting, they're all going to have all this madness going on. And so uh, everything that happens in Bitcoin, in my mind, you can, you can kind of see is going to happen with all these others. So the lesson and the thing I want to talk about today is Bitcoin, because one of the most craziest things that has happened and something that we never thought would happen, at least uh, uh, you know, where it did happen and then the world didn't end, and that is with this whole thing that's happened now with uh, uh, the fork that happened in, in August la uh, last month. Now before I continue, I'd just like to know who, who actually is an investor in Bitcoin? Who, who has Bitcoin? And, uh, and who of you had Bitcoin before August the 1st? And do you, who still has your Bitcoin cash? Okay, so I want to now talk to you about <coughs> that. And uh, this is going to be the, 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 the topic of my, of my talk. It's going to be Bitcoin and the case for cash. And uh, at the bottom over there, we've got both logos. Can you tell the two apart? Yeah. No, not really. Uh, and I think that's important. Uh, I don't think that Bitcoin Cash is an altcoin. I do think that it's Bitcoin. Whether it's going to be the Bitcoin, we don't know. And I'm very pleased that they've kept the name Bitcoin Cash. And now we have Bitcoin Cash, we've got Bitcoin Core. And maybe there'll be other Bitcoins. I can hear nowadays that everyone's trying to jump on this Bitcoin Cash bandwagon. And there's something called Bitgold and Bitcoin Gold or whatever. Uh, I think that's all going to be rubbish. But we now have, you know, we had Bitcoin, the first currency that was anonymous and grew and became uh, bootstrapped and now is a global currency. Uh, and that was the first, and I don't think it's going to be easy for another currency to do what Bitcoin did. But now we have Bitcoin Cash, the first official Bitcoin fork. And I don't think any other fork is going to actually warrant the same sort of merit that Bitcoin Cash has. Of course, there's going to be copycats, but I think they'll all just sort of become, you know, like, okay, those guys are just trying to be copycats. Now, uh, in terms of Segwit2x, because you know that that's happening uh, in November sometime. I don't know if you're aware of that whole issue. We don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, my personal opinion is, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I, I imagine that it, it, it shouldn't happen. I don't think there's any need for it anymore. Uh, you know, I think that uh, now that we have uh, Segwit, which is I'm going to talk about, in fact, this is what the whole talk's going to be. I'm going to describe all these things that you might have heard about that don't understand. Uh, we've got, we've got uh, small blocks and we've got big blocks. And uh, uh, now we don't need to you know, have another ver a variation on that. So I'm going to discuss the issues around this. Uh, I'm not going to be technical. Uh, I want this to be something that uh, you understand. So I'm going to be uh, explaining all those things you might have heard about, like Lightning Network. Have you heard about Lightning Network? Okay, Ooh, okay. So Lightning Network is, is, the, is, we hope, the solution that's going to fix Bitcoin scaling problem. You know, it's slow and expensive. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about that so you understand how that works. I'm going to talk about this thing called segregated witness, which is another solution. I know this sounds boring, uh, but I promise you at the end of this, you're going to know a lot more, and I'm going to uh, uh, make you, uh, you know, really think seriously about this form thing, because that's what I want you to do. I, w I want you to not be somebody who's closed-minded and thinks, well, here we are, and I'm happy with what I have as a Bitcoin holder. I want to forget about everything else. The world is dynamic. Things change all the time, and I've always been a very firm believer in Bitcoin, but uh, uh, telling you now, this Bitcoin cash thing has rocked my world in a good way, and I'm now going to try and open up all this for you, so you can now leave here and have a much better understanding about these issues, and uh, you can make the right sort of decisions, because at the end of the day, this is your future, you know, it's, you're investing in this stuff, you know, you're taking a huge amount of risk, and uh, uh, you must make sure that you are informed about all the issues that are around there, you can't just always... Uh, you know, look, you know, for authorities, you know, you're going to have to know about this stuff too. Okay, uh, I'm not sure how much time I have, but uh, uh, I'm going to try and keep it condensed. What time should I end? <laughs>
Oh, no. oh my goodness, okay, I better get going. All right, okay, so, you know, all of you were contrarians when you got into Bitcoin, you know? Uh, everybody, uh, probably, when you first heard about Bitcoin and you told people about Bitcoin, you said, Bitcoin's cool, and everyone probably said, oh, that's rubbish, it's never going to work. But here you are today, you're at a crypto conference, you guys have decided to uh, go against the grain, and you're now uh, becoming a contrarian. But guess what? Bitcoin isn't being a contrarian anymore. Bitcoin, if you ask me, is mainstream. I mean, it's on CNBC, it's all over the world, everybody's talking about Bitcoin, everybody wants to get in, and so on. So you're not a contrarian anymore if you're getting into Bitcoin. So uh, uh, you're going to have to, to uh, keep that spirit of being a contrarian, and at some point you're gonna, you might have to look at this world that we're in right now and again go against the grain and become a contrarian again. You've done it once before. But don't think now that you're in that, that uh, flow that, you, that, that you've done everything you need to do. You're going to have to keep on thinking. You're going to have to keep on... Uh, 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 sometimes there'll be new facts that come along. You're going to have to probably step out of that flow again and move in a different direction. Now, Bitcoin came about, when it came about, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, all about this, this idea of we don't like the system, you know, the 2008 financial crisis messed us up, we can see what happens when governments control money, when we have a fiat system where people, uh, central banks can just print money, we don't want that, we want to, uh, uh, to, to have our own little private money, and there was this whole movement around uh, uh, creating uh, uh, cryptography and ways to uh, uh, make your information private and be able to transact privately. And if you know about, about Edward Snowden, you know, one of the, 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 the things about Edward Snowden and people like him, Julian Assange and all those guys, is they're called the cypherpunks. And the cypherpunks are all about being able to control their information and never having to depend on anybody else uh, uh, for, for something. You know, if they want to be able to uh, transact, if they want to send money to people, if they want to have information that they move to somebody, they want to have complete control over that and not have to ask somebody else to mediate on their behalf, like a bank. You know, if you've got, a, uh, if you've got money in a bank and you want to transact, you've got to ask for bank permission, essentially. So the cypherpunk movement was all about keeping your information safe, keeping it secure, uh, making sure that governments and everybody can't uh, get in, involved, and making sure that you are independent and you cannot uh, uh, be uh, restrained from whatever you want to do. And the, the most famous example, of course, is Wikileaks. Now, you know what happened with Wikileaks? Wikileaks was accepting a lot of donations uh, using these third-party payment providers. You know, they, Wikileaks depended on donations, and uh, uh, they were using these uh, services. But what happened? Uh, eventually, uh, the government kind of started cracking down on Wikileaks because it started uh, pr uh, publishing all these secrets, you know, that were uh, 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 damning for the, for, the, for the government agencies, you know, and all that. So what did they do? The government just said, okay, uh, PayPal, Western Union, Visa, you're not allowed to uh, service uh, uh, Wikileaks. Uh, you are, 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 start, are banned from doing that. So Wikileaks <coughs> was stuck. They wouldn't, weren't able to now publish very important information for all of our, our, our sakes. Uh, so what came along? Of course, uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin in 2009. And in fact, you know, when uh, Wikileaks first uh, came out that they were supporting Bitcoin, I remember that day. It was very exciting because I thought, wow, look, you know, a big organization is now looking at Bitcoin seriously. It's not just all our cyberpunk geeks. Uh, this is very cool. But Satoshi Nakamoto, he was still around in those days and he was still talking on the forums and he said, oh no, this is not a good thing because now suddenly Bitcoin is not going to just be this, you know, a liberating sort of technology where people can privately uh, inter uh, transact with each other. Now it's, 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 it's sort of uh, involved with government secrets and espionage and all that sort of thing. So it's going to bring the name of Bitcoin down. And of course, we you know, we saw what happened then, you know, Mt. Gox and Silk Road and there was all these bad stories. Uh, about uh, Bitcoin, which was unfortunate. Um, so censorship resistance was all about the cypherpunks. Cypherpunks uh, want to be able to allow WikiLeaks to receive money from anybody they like. And that's a very important thing. Now, I'm going to start uh, moving into, into uh, uh, the, how Bitcoin works. So I want you to bear with me, but it's, it's not going to be technical. By the way, if you guys are technical and you think that I'm you know, a little bit too superficial, you can troll me on Twitter later. This is really for a general audience, and I really want you to, to, to for the people who are not technical people, to understand these things. So what I want to do is I want to discuss Bitcoin now. I want to show you how Bitcoin is all about censorship resistance. In other words, if I want to pay somebody, no one's allowed to stop me. No one can res uh, censor my uh, uh, speech, and nobody can censor my, my, my money speech. You know, when you pay, you're almost like talking with value. You know, you're giving information to somebody, or you're giving value to somebody. So what I want to do now is I want to show you how Bitcoin works, and uh, why the cypherpunks are very, uh, 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 very uh, you know, uh, wanting to be sure that you guys are never going to have to depend on third parties. 
So if we have Alice and Bob over here, and Alice and Bob want to transact in Bitcoin, obviously we're going to need a miner, all right? Miners are very important. They're the guys who are processing transactions and securing the network for us. They aren't the intermediaries, by the way. Miners don't care about your transactions. They're not going to stop you from paying. In fact, miners very much want you to, to, to move money around the world to anybody you like. Miners are completely neutral in this regard, so they're not our third party. Okay, but now if Alice wants to pay Bob, what we could do in the olden days, or what we can do kind of now, really, uh, uh, but in the olden days it was almost necessary, is you could actually have Bitcoin running on your laptop or, or on your machine. Bitcoin is a, is a piece of software that runs, and what it is, it's called, it creates what's called a node, and it downloads the blockchain database. But that means now that you have that blockchain database, and you can now create transactions into that database, and you can broadcast those out to the miners. So very, something very important for, for Alice, and there's a, a transaction that she's creating. She says, this is the way the money's going. I'm going to sign it with my signature. I'm now going to use my little laptop to broadcast that transaction to the miner. That is exactly what uh, uh, this whole idea about the cyberpunks and everybody wants you to do. They want you to be independent. Can you see how Alice doesn't depend on anybody here to transact? Okay, a very important thing. So um, let me now show you what happens when in the Bitcoin world when uh, uh, there are transactions. And this is going to give you an understanding about blockchains and transactions and how they're flying around. Okay. By the way, at the end of this, you're going to be able to put blockchain on your LinkedIn profile and you're going to be able to get a promotion. Okay. So take, take, take this seriously. <laughs> so the way Bitcoin works is that every couple of minutes, transactions like Alice from Alice to Bob are flying around the world. So what we have now, suddenly in the Bitcoin world, is three people have transacted <coughs> with each other. Okay. And they've created three transactions. So then what happens is a block is now going to be created in the, in the Bitcoin world, and those transactions now go and squeeze inside that block, okay? So there we got a block, it's a little bit hard to see, but there you can see it. And then what happens next, in the next 10 minutes, there's another bunch of transactions that, that uh, fly around, and uh, a new block is created, and those transactions fly into that block, and so on, okay? Uh, and this is now what's happening every single 10 minutes, okay? But what's important to note is that there's only a certain amount of size that those blocks can be. Uh, and with Bitcoin, it's always been one megabyte. You know, that was a, 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 a rule that was put into the software back in the, the early days, and it was put in there not because of, it was necessary for the system to work, but just Satoshi Nakamoto said, well, we'll create a one megabyte block so people can't just, you know, spam the network, essentially, because in those days, uh, the transactions were free, so it was very easy to spam. And so uh, Satoshi said, well, listen, we'll just make these one megabyte blocks. That is what the block mining is all about. Picking up these transactions, miners put them into blocks, and they, and they create it. Now what happens is that if you are running a node, in other words, if you are being somebody who is now independent and you don't have to rely on a third party to process trans uh, to broadcast transactions for you, you're going to need a hard drive. And every 10 minutes, there are going to be blocks updating your hard drive. Okay, that's what that's what goes on. Now, can you see that after a while, your hard drive is going to get all filled up? Okay. So a very important thing for these cyberpunks who want to make sure that you're independent, and this is, these are the guys that have built Bitcoin, and this is the philosophy around Bitcoin, is that we must make sure that everybody, if they want to, can do this. Because that's the whole point, that you can have a hard drive, and you can now, every 10 minutes, pick up a megabyte of data. Um, and that's not very onerous on anybody. You know, uh, if you think about it, every 10 minutes there's a megabyte coming into your hard drive. I mean, you know, after a couple of days, you know, you've got a couple hundred megs. It's not such a big deal. Okay. But now, uh, uh, with, with, the, with the cyberpunks, w uh, with Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is becoming so popular nowadays, we notice that there's loads of transactions, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of transactions nowadays. It's not just you and me back in the old days, you know, sending each other practice uh, Bitcoin transactions. Now there's, there's a, a commerce going on, and people are really sending a lot of uh, Bitcoin. And we've now started to see, I don't know if you noticed, but Bitcoin fees are really high. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, 50 rand. You can pay 50, 60 rand uh, uh, for a fee. Uh, it also takes forever. And the reason for that is because when you have these little blocks, uh, those blocks can only fit in a certain amount of transactions. And so what happens is the transactions that have been created have to hang around for another 10 minutes and uh, uh, until the next block gets created so they can go inside into that next block. Um, and this is now why uh, Bitcoin is becoming unmanageable. It's actually becoming hard to use, you know, because uh, if I want, in the older days, you know, I would send people Bitcoins, you know, at these conferences, those are the good old days, you know, and it would be easy for me to do it because I could just say, oh, you want, you know, 50 rands worth of Bitcoin? There it is, you know, it costs me nothing. Now, if you want to do that, you're going to have to fork out 50 bucks before you make the transaction. It's going to be, you're going to have to think about that. 
So Bitcoin has become really problematic, and this is now all the politics and all the madness that has been going on in Bitcoin land and actually tearing everybody apart. No longer are we this big brotherhood, you know, and sisterhood, where we're all family and we're all working together in this aim to bring censorship resistance, sound money to everybody. Now it's a big disaster, you know, because now there's all this fighting going on, because we have this thing called full blocks. Now, I just want to quickly show you a chart. I am going to have charts, but charts are easy to understand, I'm sure. Uh, this is now uh, what happens whenever, uh, this chart over here is showing you uh, unconfirmed transactions. In other words, those transactions that are sitting out there, waiting to get into a block, but they can't get into a block. <coughs> as soon as there are lots of transactions that are, are going, uh, hanging around, suddenly fees for Bitcoin transactions go really up. And you can, always, you can actually see how there's a direct correlation. The fuller, the, 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 the more of transactions, then the higher the fees. And this is a huge problem. Because if we want Bitcoin to be money for everybody, because I do, you know, I, I, I really would like everybody uh, in the most rural areas one day to be able to use Bitcoin, this is just not sustainable. And so we have this big uh, battle uh, over here. Um, well, one of the solutions if you do have a, a problem like this, why don't we just go ahead and um, raise the block size? You know, that was a, a, one of the, 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 the solutions here. Because if we have these uh, bigger blocks, well, then we can go and put all these transactions in, in, in here. And you'd think that that would be a very simple solution, right? You know, just instead of making it one megabyte, make it two or five or ten. Sure, okay, every ten minutes I'm going to have ten megabytes coming into my hard drive. My hard drive's going to fill up a little bit quicker. But maybe that's not such a, 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 bad, a bad thing. But actually, these bigger blocks has become kind of the root of the problem. Because as soon as you have a situation like this, where you have these miners... Um, I'm sorry, actually this slide uh, is a slide about the fees, but uh, what you're going to do now, as soon as you have these bigger blocks, it means that people are going to have to have bigger hard drives, and also they're going to have to have more bandwidth, more data to be able to move these big blocks around. And so the cyberpunk kind of philosophy is like, no, 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 if you do that, what's going to happen now is that less people are going to be able to have these little nodes. You know, where they can now transact independently without trusting a third party. And uh, it's going to mean it's impossible for them to do that. And what's going to happen is that mining and nodes are going to become centralized. And as soon as you have a centralized thing, you know, like a, a, a company maybe that's holding this, uh, this node, it's very easy for somebody to come along and shut you down. So cyberpunks are very eager and very keen for uh, uh, there not to be these bigger sizes. And this is the big debate that's going on. Bigger blocks... Or do we keep the blocks small and try other solutions? But now let me tell you another thing that uh, the, the cyberpunks are, are, are saying, and also people are disagreeing with this big block thing, is that if you have these giant blocks, not only is it going to be a mission to like uh, move those blocks around, but what about fees? You know, uh, remember mining is going to the, the rewards are only going to come you know for the next couple or that's 120 years, but you know the, the rewards are going down. You know, in two years' time the block reward is going to go down. Right now it's, it's 12 and a half. New Bitcoin is coming into the system. Well, in 2020, it's going to be uh, half of that. Was that six point something? Okay. So miners are going to be getting less and less Bitcoin until eventually they get zero. So it's very important that Bitcoin has fees. You know, we can't just have a, a Bitcoin with no fees. It's going to be unsustainable. Miners aren't going to be incentivized, and we need them. All right. Uh, but let me explain to you now why, even if you had a bigger block. Why uh, uh, it would be there would still be a fee market, okay? And I'm going to give you some of the, the things around this, so you, you can feel like, hang on, maybe bigger blocks aren't such a big uh, a bad problem. By the way, you know, uh, uh, Bitcoin was uh, uh, created in 2009, 2008, 2009. You know, Gordon uh, Moore's law about uh, bigger hard drives. I mean, our data capacity. I know uh, now, uh, ten years ago, I didn't have my. I think I was a 10 meg line at home. I didn't have that, you know, in those days. Uh, you know, storage is cheap. So I think that uh, that whole issue is overblown. But let me talk about the fee uh, uh, market as well. Now, there's a bunch of different things that happen when uh, miners and, uh, are processing blocks. It's not just that they have this hard drive problem, you know, where they want to now store a certain amount of, of uh, transactions. Miners are all racing against the clock. Because remember, every 10 minutes, on average, a miner finds uh, a, a, a solution to the block and then creates a block. So all these miners are now trying very hard to race against the clock to find that little magic number called the nonce so they could be able to create these blocks. So what miners do is they don't often always wait a full 10 minutes for their blocks to get full. Sometimes what they do is they kind of like shortcut. They say, mm, okay, I'm going I'm to collect transactions for about three minutes and then I'll quickly start you know, calculating the proof of work so I can now be, have a head start on everybody else. 
So there's a time dimension here. Miners are always trying very hard to, to, to try and uh, uh, get in as quickly as possible to solving that block, okay? So we've got the time thing. Another thing is that uh, um, uh, we've got the bandwidth stuff as well. So some miners might think, hmm, if I have a full megabyte block, maybe that's gonna take longer for me to propagate throughout the network. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just have enough transactions to take 500 kilobytes, and then I'll have a much quicker, you know, be able to propagate that a lot quicker, and also my hard drive won't fill up. So miners have the time problem that they are, are racing against. They also have the size of the block. And also what they want to do, this is the third thing, is they want to now get as much fee as possible. So what they usually do is they look for all the transactions with the high fees, the highest fees they can. They say, okay, I'm going to get all the highest fees. And then I'm going to only include those ones into the block. So if you had a giant block, it's not going to mean that now everybody's just going to be putting free transactions in because miners might only select you if you have a fee on that block. Also, they might only have a certain amount of time to do that. So uh, if, you were to, if somebody were to say to you, listen, a big block is a huge problem because now there's not going to be any fees, it does, that, that, that's not true. There will always be a fee market involved. So what we have over here is just a picture of just showing you that these miners are constantly finding a block and then kind of trying to distribute it around, around the network. Okay. So um, the argument against big blocks and fees is just, just, just doesn't make sense. But now let me get back into this whole idea about uh, censorship resistance, because this is a big thing when we have uh, what we call mining uh, <laughs> node centralization. Let's say Alice now over here did want to create a transaction, but now she couldn't uh, uh, support a node. Maybe she didn't have enough bandwidth or enough hard drive space. And this is what the cypherpunks, you know, the, the small block, uh, block uh, Bitcoin people are trying to fight against. Well, what she would have to do is she would have to go and find a third party. Now, if you guys all use Bitcoin wallets, you're probably connected to an exchange or you probably are, are, are connected to some service out there that is now propagating and broadcasting your transactions for you. Do you all have Bitcoin wallets or crypto wallets? If you've got a mobile wallet, what you're doing is you're depending on a third party. But again, the problem with that third party, uh, if, uh, if Alice wants to go and send the transaction to them, is that uh, what can happen is now that uh, somebody can come and, and, and lock that person down. Okay, so this is now a big issue with, uh, with the, the, the guys who are against the big blocks, is how to now stop this. We want to make sure that everybody can have a node. That's the idea with this. By the way, can you see this? There's going to be two different uh, cha uh, trains of thought. I'm going to visualize it for you just now. We've got the, the, the great divide, the great split between uh, the community now and Bitcoin is, do we have these little small blocks and try and find alternative solutions? Or do we just go and upgrade the block size? Okay, and, you, and uh, that's what I'm trying to just show you, that, there's, you know, that there, we have to try and figure that out. Because it now has implications. Because now with the fork, you have to make a decision what you think is going to become the, the main Bitcoin. Because I do think one of them is going to survive. And this is information to help you decide that. Okay, okay so this is a completely against censorship resistance. We can't have a situation where somebody can come along and block our transactions. We don't want that. Okay, all right. Um, but you know what, that's silly. You know, we all want Bitcoin to be huge. We all want cryptocurrencies to be huge, right? We all want to be able to go buy our groceries with Bitcoin. We want to be able to earn our salaries with Bitcoin. We want to pay our rent. We want to live with Bitcoin. We don't want to live with paper rubbish money anymore. You know, we, are, we, we want Bitcoin to become the global currency that is everywhere, right? So for us to think that it's always going to be a bunch of, you know, geeks like us, we're all geeks, we all of you are geeks, of, like just interacting and exchanging with each other. Of course not. We know what happens with big corporates. You know, uh, as soon as there's something cool out there, of course they're going to want to get in on it. And that's cool for us too. Because I said, uh, you know, like I said, if I go to Woolies now, I'm going to want to buy my groceries with Bitcoin. I wish uh, that could happen. By the way, I'm working on that. That's, that might happen by the end of the year. Who knows? Okay. So what's going to happen? What happens in the, in, it's going to happen in the future? Is of course we're going to have uh, uh, these, these uh, uh, big entities that are going to have an interest in making sure that your transactions get broadcast to the mining network. Because if I go to Woolies over here, and I want to go and pay Woolies, I don't care if my transaction gets there, because if, if Woolies gives me my groceries, I don't care what happens to the transaction. But Woolies is going to care. They want to make sure that, you know, when you go to the, if you're using a credit card, when you swipe your credit card, you know, they want to make sure that that money lands up in their bank account. So what's going to happen here is that you're going to see big retailers and all the, the companies that you're going to be uh, engaging with in the future, they are going to have the interest in making sure that your transaction gets propagated. So you're going to be able to go to Woolies and just give them the transaction and walk away. You don't care if it gets propagated, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, if it doesn't, you keep the money. So they are going to have an interest. And this is going to be how the world is going to look. 
in the future. It's not going to be geeks out there with little minds and little nodes, and that's going to now support this global network with this global payment system. Um, of course, that doesn't make sense. You know, this is how it's going to be. So having these large entities being able to have these enormous hard drives with enormous bandwidth, they don't care how big the data is. You know, they want to just make sure they get paid. I mean, they can, uh, they can afford to have these enormous uh, processes, processing powers, you know, stations and all that sort of thing. This is going to be the future of Bitcoin, not a bunch of geeks holding uh, a node. So this whole idea about big blocks and small blocks, you know, again, in my mind, is, uh, is irrelevant. Um, let me quickly now explain to you uh, the Bitcoin, because I want to now give you another solution in favor of the small blocks. Um, you know, because the small blockers are saying, and this is what we call ourselves, I guess, you've got the big blockers and you've got the small blockers. You know, people who think a big block is an easy solution, the ones who say, no, 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 we don't want big blocks, we want small blocks. And then explain to you now what the small block uh, people are doing. By the way, small block is Bitcoin Core, okay? The big block is Bitcoin Cash. That's what the, what's happened now, that's the big split here. So let's see what Bitcoin Core is trying to fix here without having to raise this block size so they can make sure that we have censorship resistant money, okay? So let me explain to you now how Bitcoin transactions work. Okay, like I said, you're going to have an education and you're going to be able to go back and, and add this to your, your CV. All right. So what happens now with, uh, with Bitcoin is that uh, you create a transaction and you have to sign it. Do you know what you've got to sign it with? Your private key. You guys know about your private keys? Do you know where your private keys are? Do you have your private keys? I hope you do. Most people okay. don't know where they are. Okay, so if you have your private key, what happens is you're going to sign a transaction and that creates a digitally signed transaction and then that is what gets sent into the blocks, alright? And that is how Bitcoin works. Now we've got a signed transaction and the miners uh, 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 confirm that. So what did this small, the Bitcoin core guy say? Because remember, they don't want to raise the block size. They want to be able to squeeze more transactions into those blocks. And right now, if you have a Bitcoin transaction, if you could try and minimize the information that was in that Bitcoin transaction, you would be able to squeeze more uh, transactions in there and we'd be able to get more throughput, more volume, uh, lower the fees and, and all that good stuff. So what uh, uh, the Bitcoin Core guys have done is they said, okay, we'll take the transaction. What we'll do is we'll sign that transaction and verify it. But then before we stick it into the block, we're going to get rid of that signature. We're going to take the signature out because that weighs quite a lot inside that transaction. And that's what we're going to go and put inside the block. That means now we can have almost twice the amount of transactions per block. So look, we've now solved the problem of having to uh, not have to raise our block sizes and we can get more transactions in, into it. So that's kind of the, the solution. But now, that's a huge problem. And I, I'm going to tell you now uh, why that's a huge problem. First of all, uh, it, this is not actually the definition of Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin, uh, this is what segregated witness is, by the way. Segregated means separated. And witness, you know when you have to witness a document, you sign it. So what we're doing is we're separating the signature, we're separating the witness. Well, when it comes to di digital signatures, you know, this is something that actually was always inherent in Bitcoin. You know, in Bitcoin, uh, the white paper, who's read the white paper? Okay, all right, good, it's only a couple pages, it's not that hard. Um, in the white paper on, uh, on page two, there's a section of here, you don't have to read it, what's important is that it says, Bitcoin basically is a chain of digital signatures, all right? Uh, that was a, a very important part about Bitcoin. Now, I'm not going to say that, uh, 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 you know, that we need to stick to the rules, you know, the, the, the kind of the Ten Commandments of Bitcoin that Satoshi gave us. You know, times change and technologies change. And okay, fine, you know, if this is the definition of Bitcoin in 2009, well, maybe it doesn't have to be the definition of Bitcoin now. But actually, the signature is a very important thing. Because digitally signed documents is something that we've all had for a long time now. I don't know how many years, I'm sure at least a decade. You know, there's a whole lot of law and a whole established <coughs> framework around digitally signing documents. You know that you, can, you don't always have to you know, have pen sign. The law, uh, uh, the, the legal industry recognizes, and we've got Norton Rose Fulbright here can verify this, uh, that digitally signed documents are signed and they are uh, uh, official. Now, with Bitcoin, we are hoping that this becomes this kind of a, a, a payment system that can be something that can stand up in a court of law, but by, by separating the signature out of uh, uh, out of the transaction, maybe what we're going to do is is mess that up for ourselves. Where in the future transactions cannot be, you know, kind of legally binding. This is just a, a quick bit of text. I hate text on slide, but I'm just going to quickly show you an electronic signature is data which is attached to, incorporated in, or logically associated with 
other data which is intended by the user to serve as a signature. So what we're going to do with segregated witness is we're going to remove this whole useful uh, uh, thing that we've had uh, with, with digitally signed uh, documents for a long time, that it's very well established, and we're going to remove that feature out of Bitcoin, where now we cannot ever go to a court of law and say, look, that was my transaction, and here's the signature to prove it. Segregated witness it removes that feature for us. So that's just, to me, a, a reason why I think segregated witness maybe isn't such a great idea, but I, I, I won't argue, I'll, you know, of course we'll, we'll have the benefit you know, of the doubt, but that's just something to think about. Um, so, let me now explain to you some more about what this whole uh, a small block Bitcoin core is trying to do right now. <coughs> Remember, they need to figure out a way where we can have instant, cheap transactions. And do you know what? If we keep those blocks at one megabyte, and that's what core really wants to do, you know, they don't want to upgrade it to, to 2x, even though that uh, they, 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 we thought that this would happen. It doesn't look like it's going to happen. Core has now said, we're not going to create a 2 megabyte block. That was a deal. We're going to keep it at 1 megabyte. So what's their solution? Because it, really, 1 megabyte blocks is never going to be able to support, no matter how much you strip out of those transactions, never going to support uh, uh, all the world's transactions, which is what we wanted to do, right? So they have now got a very interesting new solution, and this is what's called the Lightning Network. And what happens is now they are creating another kind of layer of technology on top of Bitcoin. If Alice wants to pay Bob now, what we're going to do is we're going to be using this other kind of network, which is going to be what is called the transaction layer. This is what, is, uh, what, what uh, the Lightning Network is all about. We're going to keep Bitcoin at the bottom as this kind of settlement layer, and we're going to have the Lightning Network, which is going to be the thing that is fast and cheap. Okay, we'll make, uh, and Bitcoin will be slow and expensive, but the, the stuff on the top. So what happens now, and let me explain, explain this to you as well, uh, uh, when uh, Alice wants to now go and create a transaction and send it to Bob, what she does is she creates a transaction and, and it puts it into Bitcoin, all right? And what she's essentially doing is she's now funding a kind of account on the Lightning Network. So there you can see a little token, it's not a Bitcoin, uh, uh, that is now funding her channel, let's call it, okay? Uh, uh, and once it's on the channel, then she is going to be able to now very quickly and easily using this very new network that, by the way, is not in production and we, we, we don't know how, uh, how it's going to turn out. Uh, and then what she can do is she, she can now go and send money to uh, uh, Bob. And what happens is now is that she has to now go and find what's called a path through the network, because the way it works is that she can't send that uh, uh, money directly to Bob. What's going to happen is she's going to send that little IOU or that little token, and uh, it's going to kind of go through that, and she has to find a path where people who have the same amount of money she wants to send, uh, what happens is they receive the IOU from her, and they send one on. So did you see how that worked? And this can go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and it's quick and it's cheap and it goes on and on and so on and so on and so on. You can do it all day and you can do it for months and so on. And you never have to touch Bitcoin. But you're not actually transacting with Bitcoin. You're just transacting with the sort of IOU stuff. You know, I owe you this much. And we, it's, a, it's a smart contract there. Smart contract just means, you know, these deals between people and promises and all that sort of thing. Okay. And then when, when the deal is done, what happens next is that uh, Bob goes and creates kind of a, a finalizing transaction and he puts it into the blockchain and the deal is done. And then the money moves over to, to uh, Bob. Okay. So this is the solution that the Bitcoin <coughs> core small blockers are trying to do now. They're trying to bring this whole uh, uh, concept in here where we can keep Bitcoin as a settlement layer because everything settles in there. And ultimately this goes on. But this settlement is going to be extremely expensive. You know, this, uh, this is unfortunately just how it's going to be. And this is the hope that the Lightning Network is going to solve the problem for us finally, where we don't have to upgrade the blocks, we don't have to do anything crazy, all we can do is use this entirely new network, and uh, we can do all this quickly and cheaply. But by believing in this, you're essentially believing, it's the same as believing in all these, you know, these ICOs and all these tech companies, you know, they, they all have these great ideas, you know, they've been testing, and it's all wonderful, and what you do is you're going to hope that eventually when it comes out, that it works. Because right now they've been testing it, but we haven't seen Lightning Network in production. We don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, maybe it will be cool, maybe it won't. It's a lot of, lot of hope to put on a network that you are putting your life into. You're depending on this whole thing. Okay. So the question now is, well, what on earth you know, are you going to think? Because we now have this very clear issue 
where uh, there's this big divide in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, it's not easy anymore. It's not like saying, oh, well, I bought Bitcoin and I'm cool. And I'm just going to sit on it and I'm going to you know, wait a couple of years and I'm going to retire. You can't. In the same way that you had to make that decision once upon a time, put money into Bitcoin, you had to take that risk. You're going to have to think again now. You're going to have to, to, to make a decision and you're going to have to be uh, clever, like you were clever before getting into Bitcoin. Okay. You're going to have to think about these issues because uh, this is a big problem. Now, before Bitcoin split, everybody thought, hang on, if Bitcoin ever were, was to do this, you know, uh, uh, it was going to be the end of Bitcoin because now suddenly we're going to have indecision like what I'm talking about right now. Not only that, we're going to have, instead of 21 million Bitcoins, we're going to have 42 million Bitcoins. And that goes against the entire reason why we got into Bitcoin in the first place. That it has, so, it has a fixed supply. That's part of the sound money principles that we believe in. And if this can happen, suddenly supply can be created overnight with all these different chains. It's going to ruin Bitcoin. And uh, uh, before that, I thought, that's not going to happen. You know, Bitcoin forks is going to be exactly like Ethan. I wrote this uh, uh, tweet in... Um, in uh, March, so this was way before August the 1st, and I said, if Bitcoin splits, it's just going to be like Ether and Ether Classic. Do you know that? Remember that story when Ether and Ether Classic split? I don't know if you know about it. Well, it was a big deal. Did, it, did, did Ethereum die? No, it didn't. And then a lot of people came back and said, Lauren, you're completely wrong. You don't understand economics, blah, blah, blah. And uh, what they, I went back to this tweet because I wanted to screenshot it for you and uh, show you all the replies. Last night I did this, and I realized everyone deleted their replies to me. And all their, <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure it's screenshot it then. It just shows you, you know, on Twitter. You know, people are like are big mouths, and then, you know, they, they come back and delete their stuff, you know, unfortunately. Okay, so what we have now, uh, this is what happened in August the 1st. We had uh, Bitcoin, and uh, 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 this, we decided now, Bitcoin Core decided to go off on the segregated witness thing, because they're doing it now. It's, been, it's, it's actually out there. By the way, Bitcoin now is segregated witness where, uh, uh, where transactions are going to be doing this. But the problem is, is that uh, this is not a hard, what's called a hard fork. In other words, a, 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 a forced upgrade. You know, sometimes if you run software, you can upgrade your software if there's a new version come out. And you can stay on an old version. Or sometimes it says, listen, you're not allowed to run this program until you upgrade. So what happened with Bitcoin Core now is that they said this is an opt-in. It's a soft fork which means that you can have SegWit if you want to, or you don't have to. And everyone thought this was great, because now it's backwards compatible, and people can use it if they want, and it won't mess up the network. But the problem is now that we have to now have months, if not years, and we've seen this with Bitcoin before, you know, where there's an upgrade that's not forced, you know, that's not uh, uh, required, where slowly wallets start using it, and slowly miners start you know, activating, and slowly, slowly, slowly. And unfortunately, we're not going to see the segregated witness benefits probably for months. And I'm going to show you a chart next to show you uh, why. You know, the blocks are not uh, putting more throughput there in core. Bitcoin's still slow. I don't know when you lost your Bitcoin <coughs> transaction, but it still takes sometimes half an hour, an hour. It could take forever. Uh, and also the fees are very high because of this problem with opt-in only. And that's what Bitcoin core has got. It's got segregated witness in, but it's, we haven't seen the benefits of it yet, and we don't know when we're going to see it. What happened with, uh, on August the 1st is that we had Bitcoin Cash, and all they did, they didn't do all the segregated witness, they didn't have plans for the Lightning Network. All they did was they went and upgraded the block size, simply and easily. And in my mind, you know, I'm a software engineer, and I, you know, there's this whole idea of Occam's razor. You know, I'm sure you understand it. You know, never multiply entities beyond necessity. You'll never make something too complicated if you can make it simple. So what we have is this incredibly complicated system uh, in terms of core with all these fantastic engineering ideas. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's developers working on it. And I know, you know, developers love fancy, cool, crazy things. And then we have cash, which is just this basic little upgrade. And immediately now, if you are transacting on cash, you're going to notice your fees are low and you're going to notice that it's very quick. Okay, so this is now the, the situation. And I'm going to give you now some more charts and I'll, I'll, I'll finish off uh, soon. I'm sure I'm over my time a bit. Um, and I'm going to now show you what's happening because now we've had a month to see how this is panning out. You know, a lot of people were, as soon as Bitcoin Cash came along, it was like, dumb. You know, and a lot of guys, very vocal people on Twitter and all that, the big names. I don't know if you watch uh, any like Bitcoin celebs, you know, uh, World Crypto Network, you know those guys? You know, they, uh, they are, if you watch those guys on YouTube, you know, they're all like Bcash, you know, they don't even call it Bitcoin Cash and they're all dumping their Bitcoin Bcash. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see the tweets get deleted there. But let's have a quick look at uh, uh, what's been happening now in this since we've had this situation. Okay. Uh, first of all, 
This is now the average block size for Bitcoin Cash. And can you see how it goes up and it goes down and so on? Because there is no limit. Bitcoin, well there is, I mean there's an 8 megabyte limit, but uh, of course there's not enough transactions to fill that. Can you see how, what happens is if there's an enormous amount of transactions, Bitcoin Cash can swallow them up whole. It doesn't have this uh, uh, limit. And uh, in 10 minutes time, you know that all those transactions are going to get pulled together, put into a block and nailed. Okay, it doesn't matter how many transactions. But if you look at Bitcoin Core, can you see this? This is what the uh, uh, transaction volume, uh, I mean the block size has been uh, Bitcoin Core. Um, and this is the, since August the 1st. Now Bitcoin, a segregated witness came in, I can't remember, a, week, two, a few weeks ago. And can you see it's made no difference uh, to the size. And you can see a little bit of a blip over there. But we still are having this, this problem where uh, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, uh, Core is now fixed down, it's, it's nailed down into that one megabyte limit. And uh, who knows how long it's going to take for the world to finally, you know, uh, uh, you know, start changing over segwit so we can have greater volume. So it's very, a very uh, obvious way to see how Bitcoin Cash can just do it. You know, if you were, if, if if I were to send you Bitcoin right now, I would say, please let me send you Bitcoin Cash. It's going to be so much quicker and so much cheaper. Okay. Let me just show you another interesting slide. Now, what we have is this thing now that's going on where. Uh, 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 Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core basically are, uh, it's the same thing. So the miners now are looking at both of these uh, chains and they're thinking, hmm, which one should we mine? You know, if we mine Bitcoin Core, you know, we'll make so much money. And if we mine, uh, mine Bitcoin Cash, we'll make so much money. And what's been happening is that there's been this kind of fluctuation of miners deciding to mine Bitcoin Core and then suddenly they realize that mining Bitcoin Cash is more uh, uh, profitable and so they move on to Bitcoin Core, uh, Cash and every time hashing power leaves one of those networks it means that the network becomes a lot slower and more degraded. Um, so what we have over here is another chart and this blue line over here is called profit parity and basically it's showing you how if uh, uh, this chart now, uh, uh, this is the profitability of Bitcoin Cash against Bitcoin Core. And so since we've had uh, uh, Bitcoin ca uh, Cash, this is how the profitability has been. It's been less profitable, less profitable, and then suddenly it became much more profitable because difficulty changed. And now look what you, you can see now. Can you see how it's starting to become kind of the same profitability as Bitcoin Core? Which means what's happening is the playing field is becoming level. A very important <coughs> thing. Because what has happened right now is that Bitcoin Core, by being the first and by being the most widespread and every exchange supports it and wallets out there, it has a, an advantage over Bitcoin Cash. But we started to see exchanges support Bitcoin Cash. We started to see wallets support Bitcoin Cash. My wallet is certainly going to support it. I'm even thinking about only supporting Bitcoin Cash. But, uh, because, by the way, philosophically, I'm more aligned with Bitcoin Cash. But can you see now the playing field is becoming level? The exchanges are becoming level, the wallets, the mining power is starting to figure the level out. And now we're going to have these two chains, these two Bitcoins, and we now the, what we're going to be able to judge them on is, is fees and speed. And uh, uh, with the fact that this is happening, by the way, I've got another little chart here which just shows you uh, uh, another. I just did this because I thought it could show you, that the, you know, the, what's going on. You can see it's a steady uh, increase to, prof, uh, to parity that we're now going to start maybe having to make the decision. When you want to go and buy Bitcoin, or when you want to go and send Bitcoin to somebody, or when you want to go and pay Bitcoin, <coughs> do you want to use Bitcoin Core, where you're going to have to spend 50 Rand, and it might take half an hour or an hour or whatever to get there, or are you going to use Bitcoin Cash? Because you guys have Bitcoin Cash. Uh, that's going to be there, it's going to cost you nothing, it's going to cost you a few cents, and it's going to be uh, guaranteed to be in the next block. So we're now going to be in that tiny little space, and I have this, this uh, real feeling that we're going to see a real battle get played out here. The small block, highly complicated, very speculative network, a lightning network idea, and then this Bitcoin Cash idea, simple, just this block size increase. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to watch. And if you're an investor, and if you're now making decisions about this, you're going to have to think. Now, uh, you've got Bitcoin, you've got Bitcoin Cash. You know, uh, right now, I think there's quite an opportunity here. You know, uh, I think you can get about six to one already. Uh, uh, you know, imagine if you could sell your one Bitcoin and get six Bitcoin cash. What if Bitcoin cash becomes the main Bitcoin? Suddenly you've now got six times the amount. So this is the, you know, again, the kind of things you're going to have to think about. Let me show you another uh, little uh, chart. This is a chart I watch nowadays. I don't watch Bitcoin USD. You know, I, I don't know what charts you're looking at. I'm sure you're looking at Rand value, but, you know, Luna, cool, you know, 60,000, 70,000 Rand. 
That's not the chart you should be looking at. Don't look at, I mean, we all know Bitcoin's gonna go up, and we all know it's gonna go down when China says something, and we're all gonna, you know, I mean, don't watch the, the, the price. I mean, of course, everyone in this room knows Bitcoin is one day gonna be a million rand, right? I believe that, hey? Eh? That's a bit low, actually, maybe 10 million rand. So why bother looking at those charts? It's gonna give you the nightmares and a heart attack. This is the chart I look at. I'm looking at the Bitcoin versus Bitcoin cash chart. And I'm watching very carefully how this thing pans out. So this is now what it looks like. And can you see how it's looking very, very interesting? You know, people, you can see how people are starting to invest relatively uh, more. You know, it's Bitcoin versus Bitcoin Cash. And if you're looking at this chart, I think this is going to be an interesting one to follow. Okay. Bitcoin core charts are boring. You know, it's up. Fine. We got that. Okay. But this, this is going to be a very interesting one. Okay. So anyway, I hope that that just gives you some ideas around the space, and it is the most important thing right now, uh, uh, you know, for you to think about. Because if you're sitting on your Bitcoin, uh, uh, this is a decision you're going to have to make. Uh, remember, being a contrarian means, you know, that you that you can't always just be happy and become because you're all real mainstream now. We want to be, we still want to be uh, ahead of the game. Uh, this is something you have to think about. Okay. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. I think I'm going to end it there. Um, uh, I hope I've given, given you enough to think about. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yes, sir. I don't particularly lean either way. The positive and negative from both. Of course, yes. But I can see you you lean to be that fine. But now, with Bitcoin Cash, with a with an eight meg block. Yeah. The way I see it, that's a temporary solution. If this goes mainstream, yes. eight meg is behind. Yes. So it's not like a, they haven't set on and it's not going to stay eight megs. They've got they got a plan for. In fact, there's a very interesting experiment going on now where they call the Giga Block experiment. Where they're using gigabyte blocks, not big on cash. It's a, it's a trial. So, so on that, if they let's say they increase the blocks, and you're saying like we, for example, would have their own server farm, etc., etc., etc. Doesn't that move away from centralization again? Then you're going to have these big entities yeah. that are going to have control. Yes. So, so, so my, I, I don't believe that that uh, just because you've got a big entity holding the hosting, you know that it's centralization. At the end of the day. The, you know, there's thousands of corporations out there, thousands of retailers, and they're not all colluding and working together. And uh, you know, uh, it's all part of rock. Yes. So, so yes, of course, that is a, a, a thing that we should think about. That's why you know, it, it's something to, we've got to consider. But to my mind, you know, Bitcoin is not going to become this thing that governments are going to clamp down and they're going to nail every retailer, going to ban it outright. At the end of the day, the internet was a scary place once too. And, uh, uh, and I work with regulators all the time, our Reserve Bank and so on, the Financial Intelligence Center, and they are not thinking about banning Bitcoin. They, I can tell you that much. They're thinking about if there are issues like money laundering and, and terrorist financing, then how do, we, how do we stop it? And the best way, this is their, their thinking, and this is now insight that I can give you. They are realizing that the best way they can stop money laundering and terrorism is by allowing big companies to offer Bitcoin services, because then, then at least they can go and see and audit them and check them out. And uh, if there's any uh, uh, suspicious, you know, transactions, if they, if they know their customers, give me your customer records. I know that sounds scary, um, but uh, that's what governments are thinking. And we, even now we saw China, how China's not nailing, uh, clamping down on Bitcoin. They just want to stop this unregulated ICO madness, which it makes complete sense. I mean, how many ICO scams are out there? You know, there's some genuine guys out there doing cool stuff. But uh, uh, there's certainly a lot of, you know, like scams, that is for sure. So regulation in that space is welcome. But, uh, uh, um, you know, and, and that's how we're going to move the industry forward. I'm all for private money. I'm all for censorship resistant money. I'm totally into that. I do not want anybody ever to get in my face about who I'm transacting with. But I, I, I know that it's going to, uh, uh, that's how it's going to happen, you know, and uh, we'll still be able to transact pseudonymously and all that. So, uh, you know, I'm totally happy with Woolworths when they have a node that I can transact with. Yes? Is your personal fortune coin or in cash? <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 have, I have obviously both, uh, but I did actually put 10% uh, of Bitcoin into cash because I just thought, hell, you know, why not? Let me, let me make six times. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.